la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, la Universidad Mohamed V de Rabat, la Coordinación de Humanidades, el Programa Universitario de Estudios sobre Asia y África, la Cátedra Extraordinaria Fátima Mernisi y la Cátedra Graciela Hierro, le dan la más cordial bienvenida y les dan eh, la bienvenida al coloquio México y Marruecos, Espejos Transatlánticos, Diálogos e Intersecciones. Vamos a dar paso al acto inaugural del coloquio. Es para mí un honor presentarles a nuestras autoridades académicas y diplomáticas que están con nosotros el día de hoy. Nos acompaña la doctora Guadalupe Valencia, coordinadora de Humanidades de la UNAM, el doctor Mohamed Dafir El Ketani, director interino del Instituto Universitario de Estudios Africanos, Euromediterráneos e Iberoamericanos de la Universidad Mohamed V de Rabat. El excelentísimo señor Abdel Fattah Levar, embajador de Marruecos en México. Excelentísima señora Mabel Gómez, embajadora de México en Marruecos. Y la doctora Alicia Girón, coordinadora del Programa Universitario de Estudios sobre Asia y África de la UNAM. Primeramente, eh, pedimos a la excelentísima señora Mabel Gómez, embajadora de México en Marruecos, tome el uso de la palabra. Bienvenida, embajadora. Muchas gracias, muy buenos días. Saludo uh, muy calurosamente a los integrantes del presidium, amigos, funcionarios y asistentes. Es para mí un honor intervenir en esta ceremonia de inauguración del coloquio México y Marruecos, Espejos Transatlánticos, Diálogos e Intersecciones, que organiza nuestra máxima casa de estudios, la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. A lo largo de mi gestión como embajadora de México ante el Reino de Marruecos, he podido constatar el empeño, la dedicación y la convicción detrás del trabajo constante que realiza la Universidad Nacional para promover los intercambios y la colaboración entre estos dos grandes países. Efectivamente, este coloquio que hoy se inaugura tiene como preámbulo y sustento no solamente todo un andamiaje institucional constituido por distintos instrumentos interuniversitarios con los que se han formalizado esos intercambios, sino toda una conceptualización acerca de la importancia de que dos países como México y Marruecos se conozcan más, se comprendan mejor y se beneficien mutuamente construyendo juntos, aprovechando sus coincidencias y similitudes a pesar de sus diferencias. La Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, a través de sus distintas instancias, entre las que destaca la Coordinación de Humanidades, el Programa Universitario de Estudios sobre Asia y África y la Cátedra Extraordinaria Fátima Mernisi, se ha convertido no solo en una plataforma única para ahondar en el conocimiento acerca de Marruecos y sus relaciones con México, sino que constituye un aliado invaluable en los esfuerzos diplomáticos para acercar a los dos países. Conferencias, talleres, foros, diálogos y publicaciones son tan solo algunos medios con los que la UNAM y sus instancias promueven un mayor y mejor conocimiento sobre Marruecos. Un país que, al igual que México, posee una cultura rica y milenaria, que como México se ubica al lado de uno de los centros mundiales de poder político y económico. Un país que, como México, mantiene abierta su economía, cuenta con sectores exportadores de manufacturas y agrícola dinámicos, favorece el libre comercio y mantiene una amplia red de acuerdos comerciales internacionales. En esta ocasión, gracias al amplio y rico programa del coloquio que cuenta con la colaboración de la Universidad Mohamed V de Rabat y con la participación de distintas instituciones académicas marroquíes, especialistas de México y de Marruecos, nos compartirán sus análisis y puntos de vista sobre distintas materias. La geopolítica, la diplomacia y las relaciones entre estados, el feminismo, la literatura, entre otras áreas del conocimiento, serán el hilo conductor de diálogos entre mexicanas y mexicanos con sus contrapartes marroquíes, los cuales nos permitirán conocernos y reconocernos reflejados en esos espejos transatlánticos. Descubrir juntos esas intersecciones que acercan e inspiran a la colaboración y de igual manera entender mejor esas diferencias que a veces nos distancian, pero que lejos de ser un obstáculo, deben ser motivo para profundizar en nuestra mejor comprensión del otro. En las últimas dos décadas que coinciden con el reinado del rey Mohamed VI, Marruecos ha despertado y despegado como una economía emergente. Su importancia geopolítica, tanto en el ámbito regional como internacional, adquiere cada vez mayores dimensiones. A partir de una visión estratégica del rey Mohamed VI, 
que equilibra modernidad y tradición, Marruecos se ha erigido como potencia emergente en África del Norte, como puente entre África y Europa, como espacio de tolerancia y diálogo entre las civilizaciones y entre las religiones, como actor relevante y decisivo en la contención de extremismos y como escenario atractivo para la inversión y el comercio. Un país como México, que se encuentra entre las 20 principales economías del mundo y cuya política exterior promueve la diversificación y las oportunidades, no puede ignorar un país como Marruecos, con el que compartimos valores y visiones y con el que podemos construir una agenda bilateral y multilateral robusta que se traduzca en proyectos conjuntos en beneficio de las dos naciones. Mi reconocimiento muy sincero a la UNAM y a todas las instituciones mexicanas y marroquíes que han hecho posible que durante los próximos cuatro días nos encontremos alrededor de México y Marruecos. Hago votos porque este coloquio sea un éxito y contribuya a la reflexión acerca del camino que debemos seguir para provocar que en los espejos transatlánticos México y Marruecos se reflejen con una sola imagen, sin sombras, una imagen más bien nítida y con un futuro pleno de luz. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, embajadora, por tus palabras. Excelentísimo señor Adel Fatalebar, embajador del Reino de Marruecos en México. Tiene usted el uso de la palabra. Gracias. Buenos días. Mi querida amiga doctora Guadalupe Valencia, mi querida y estimada Alicia Gerón, mi, mi colega y amiga Mabel Gómez, embajadora Mabel Gómez, estimado ministro Mohamed Ben Al-Qadr, distinguidas y distinguidos profesores y académicos, muy buenos días. Quisiera en primer lugar extenderles mis más cordiales saludos y aprovechar esta gran oportunidad para expresar mi agradecimiento a la UNAM y a, la, a, las, a los organizadores de este encuentro académico-cultural de alto nivel, que deseamos que sea un preámbulo para un fructífero intercambio universitario y cultural entre esta prestigiosa Casa del Saber y el Reino de Marruecos. Para Marruecos, la cooperación universitaria ocupa una dimensión fundamental en la promoción de las relaciones bilaterales. En este marco, se articula esta privilegiada relación con la UNAM, que compartimos con su directiva la firme convicción que los intercambios universitarios fomentan el mestizaje cultural y humanístico entre los pueblos contribuyen al acercamiento entre las dos orillas del Atlántico e impulsan, sin duda alguna, la promoción de las excelentes relaciones bilaterales entre nuestros dos países. Este coloquio académico nos brinda la oportunidad de analizar y proponer soluciones para los desafíos a los cuales estamos enfrentados como socios en un mundo multipolar. Tendremos la oportunidad de reflexionar acerca de temas relevantes de nuestra actualidad. Este debate se llevará a cabo en un marco de respeto y tolerancia donde cada voz será escuchada y valorada. Por último, agradezco mucho de manera particular a mi querido amigo rector Enrique Graue por su preciosa y continua ayuda brindada a la Embajada de Reno de Marruecos en México y también agradecemos la excelente gestión de la doctora Alicia Girón y el equipo organizador de este coloquio. Asimismo, agradecemos el destacado interés por el reino de Marruecos y la presencia de tantos participantes, sin olvidar nuestros estimados profesores marroquí, por haber respondido a la llamada de sus colegas mexicanos, a pesar de su agenda universitaria, han hecho el incomiable esfuerzo de estar hoy con nosotros aquí y trasladarse más tarde a Morelia, donde Marruecos es el invitado de honor a la décima edición de la Feria del Libro de la Rosa. Espero que juntos podamos tener un diálogo constructivo y enriquecedor y avanzar hacia una plataforma de entendimiento que reforzará esta excelente relación de amistad de más de 60 años entre México y Marruecos. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, embajador. Doctora Alicia Girón, coordinadora del Programa Universitario de Estudios sobre Asia y África, tiene usted el uso de la palabra. Buenos días. 
Distinguidos miembros del presidium, es un honor celebrar esta fiesta. Ayer cuando estaba preparando unas palabras para dirigirlas a ustedes, pensé, es una fiesta para México y el Reino de Marruecos. Muchísimas gracias, doctora Guadalupe Valencia, por haber eh, inducido para que el BUEA estuviera de alguna manera eh, en la logística de este evento. Quisiera agradecer muchísimo también a la embajadora de México, quien hizo posible el poder contactar a varias universidades de Marruecos y también a distinguidos académicos y diplomáticos que están aquí con nosotros. Señor embajador, muchísimas gracias por su apoyo para hacer posible esto. Bien, pues aquí estoy, voy a tratar de, de leer estas palabras. Como les decía, estamos, eh, estamos de fiesta porque no solamente festejamos el día de hoy este encuentro México y Marruecos, espejos transatlánticos, diálogos e intersecciones, que, cuyo nombre eh, fue gracias a la doctora Cautar, quien en, la, en una reunión en, en la Universidad de Mohamed V, eh, junto con su equipo, con Raja, con Caterina y con otras investigadoras, pudimos recrear este nombre para poder llegar el día de hoy. Muchísimas gracias, Cautar. Después, eh, pues sí, es por un lado, es este gran coloquio, pero también se están festejando los 60 años de relaciones diplomáticas entre México y Marruecos. Ayer hubo una gran fiesta en el Senado, lo cual es un honor para México haber tenido la presencia de usted, señor embajador, con la comitiva de amigos y diplomáticos del de Reino de Marruecos. Eh, también, eh, efectivamente, la fiesta no termina hoy, ni termina pasado mañana, sino que nos vamos a Morelia para festejar al invitado especial Marruecos de la, en la Feria del Libro y la Rosa en Morelia, a quien debemos de agradecer muchísimo todo el apoyo de Mariana Macera y de la UDIR, que hizo posible, junto con la Secretaría de Cultura, eh, este evento. Pero quizás uno de los ejes eh, a los, alrededor de los cuales estamos haciendo esos eventos es nada menos que la Cátedra Fátima Mernisi, la cual en esta ocasión, y, y seguirá por siempre, el, el, eh, pues el anfitrión o la anfitriona, nuestra universidad, pero principalmente la Coordinación de Humanidades. Y por supuesto, celebramos que la Universidad Mohamed V tenga a su cargo y sea anfitrión de la Cátedra Graciela Alguier. Este diálogo entre Fátima y Graciela es muy interesante porque a pesar de venir de, distintos, eh, de distintas formaciones económicas, políticas y sociales, a través de sus escritos se juntan las dos para darnos visibilidad a las mujeres y sobre todo continuar el trabajo de la lucha y el reconocimiento de los trabajos de las mujeres y también romper espacios culturales como es el patriarcado. Tengo otros datos que ayer estaba buscando. Como economista no los voy a, los tengo que decir. En primer lugar, son datos que los conseguimos la semana, el, el año pasado justo para la, el viaje a Marruecos. Eh, no están sumamente actualizados porque son datos que vienen de informes anteriores, pero sí quisiera decir, por ejemplo, Marruecos tiene una población de cerca de 36, 37 millones de habitantes, México tiene más de 127 millones. O sea que la cifra es una diferencia muy grande en población, pero tenemos muchas similitudes, por ejemplo, la población que reside en el, en el extranjero, Marruecos tiene 5 millones, nosotros tenemos cerca de 12 millones en el extranjero. Las remesas también son muy importantes para ambos países. Marruecos recibe cerca de 7 millones, eh, bueno, 7 mil millones de dólares, México cerca de 42 mil millones. El PIB es, bueno, eh, representa 114 eh, 
mil millones de dólares, nosotros sobrepasamos el millón, pero la variación eh, del Producto Interno Bruto a raíz de la pandemia fue menor. Es muy interesante cómo Marruecos solamente disminuyó en menos 6.3, en cambio México en menos 8.3. El PIR per cápita, por supuesto, varía bastante, yo diría que casi tres veces más eh, del, entre Marruecos y México. Y la tasa de pobreza en, en Marruecos es de 4.8, esto es lo que me dice la tasa de pobreza, eh, que seguramente ha mejorado muchísimo, en cambio en México es de 43.9. Y aquí vemos la inflación también. De acuerdo a las estadísticas, la inflación está más controlada en Marruecos que en México. Y por el otro lado también vemos el gasto gubernamental. El gasto gubernamental representa más del 36% en, en, en el gobierno de Marruecos, en cambio en México 26. Y por supuesto el balance fiscal es mayor en México, eh, perdón, mayor en, en Marruecos en, que en México, pero esto, para los que de alguna manera ven, eh, estamos eh, educados en la economía heterodoxa, el déficit entre más quiere decir que hay un mayor gasto y por lo, y por lo tanto una menor disminución de la pobreza. Y así vamos, no los voy a, voy a seguir, tengo más datos, ¿verdad? Pero aquí me quedo. Y otro dato quizás interesante es eh, las reservas internacionales. Las reservas internacionales en Marruecos son de 35 mil millones, en México estamos cercanos, estas varían constantemente, pero estamos cercanos a los 199 mil millones. Yo con esto me gustaría seguir, me gustaría también comentar que, por ejemplo, eh, pues los españoles también nos conquistaron, tanto a Marruecos como a México durante el siglo XVI, y, y bueno, los, eh, en Marruecos los españoles establecieron un protectorado en el norte del país en 1912, mientras que en México pues la colonización española comenzó en 1521 y duramos casi más de dos siglos para podernos independizar. Por el otro lado, la independencia, me, eh, Marruecos se independiza eh, ya eh, a, a mediados del siglo pasado de Francia, México se independizó en 1821 y bueno, eh, hemos tenido eh, revoluciones que han ayudado a quitar el dominio de las colonias. Por el otro lado, eh, las religiones ocupan un lugar muy importante. En México la religión católica, en Marruecos el Islam es la región predominante. Y también es muy importante el incremento del comercio que tiene Marruecos con América Latina. Algo que me... Me parece sorprendente es la cooperación sur-sur. Tanto Marruecos como México son líderes en la cooperación sur-sur. Y esto ayuda muchísimo a que cada vez podamos reunirnos mucho más en encuentros de este, eh, de este eh, académicos. También <coughs> quisiera des destacar <coughs> perdón, que Marruecos, al igual que México, son potencias emergentes y Marruecos es la entrada hacia eh, el África. Entonces, considero que, bueno, este eh, encuentro académico, pues, va a traer eh, muchísimos conocimientos. Vamos a poder discutir todo lo que está en este, en este programa de, de, de los espejos transatlánticos, y sobre todo porque hay está la mesa de relaciones diplomáticas, y la mesa también de, de, de las relaciones, bueno, Marruecos-México, pero también está la mesa de género que estará la, el día de mañana. Con esto, pues, tengo más hojas, no los voy a aburrir, ¿verdad? Pero este, con esto es nada más para eh, mencionar la importancia de lo que es el Reino de Marruecos para México. Bienvenidos a México. Aquí estamos y nuestros corazones están abiertos para todo lo que ustedes quieran. Y muchísimas gracias. Y muchísimas gracias, eh, doctora Guadalupe Valencia, por todos eh, los apoyos y, bueno, el haber compartido este, pues este gran coloquio con ustedes. Y como les digo ayer, dije, no, tengo que decir que el Reino de Marruecos y México están de fiesta. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias.
gracias. Muchas gracias, doctora Alicia Girón. Eh, doctor Mohamed Bafir El Ketani, director interino del Instituto Universitario de Estudios Africanos, Euromediterráneos e Iberoamericanos, Universidad Mohamed V de Rabat. Welcome to UNAM. The floor is yours. Thank you. Muchas gracias y buenos días. Excelencias, señoras y señores directores, coordinadores, directores de programas, estimados disertantes, queridos profesores y colegas, queridos invitados. Es para mí un gran placer reunirme hoy con usted y aceptar su amable invitación para participar en el acto inaugural del Coloquio México y Marruecos. Espejos, diálogos e intersecciones transatlánticas, organizado por la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. La elección del título del coloquio no es casual y obedece a un esfuerzo común de reflexión iniciado hace seis meses al margen de la organización de la Cátedra García Hierro en Rabat y esto en presencia de la profesora Alicia Gerón. Esta inauguración en octubre 2023 coincidió con el 60 aniversario de las relaciones diplomáticas entre el Reino de Marruecos y los Estados Unidos Mexicanos. Este es el tercer gran evento que une a nuestras dos universidades en el espacio de un año que comenzó cuando el doctor Enrique Coraue, rector de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, recibió el título de doctor honoris causa de la Universidad Mohamed V de Rabat el pasado febrero 2022. Hoy aquí estamos plenamente convencidos de la oportunidad de fortalecer las relaciones entre nuestros dos países a través de la diplomacia paralela. Aprovecho esta oportunidad para agradecer la UNAM por haber asociado el Instituto en las actividades de este importante coloquio, durante el cual tres de, los, tres de nuestros eminentes investigadores presentarán ponencias en sus sesiones a saber, la profesora Ashwak Shalha, la profesora Kautal Amri y la profesora Raja Hansi. Sobre el tema, movimientos feministas en Marruecos y México. Sabiendo que participarán también, poco después, en la fiesta del libro de la Rosa en Morelia. Al final de estas palabras de bienvenida, Quiero expresar mi más sincero agradecimiento a la Embajada de Marruecos en México, en la persona de su excelencia, señor el embajador, por la intención prestada a la delegación de Marruecos. Mi agradecimiento también a su excelencia, señora la embajadora de México en Rabat, por las sólidas relaciones que sigue forjando con la comunidad académica marroquí y que pudimos sentir particularmente durante la inauguración de la Cátedra Graciela Hierro el pasado mes de octubre en Rabat. Y mi cálido agradecimiento, así como todas mis felicitaciones, van finalmente a la UNAM en la persona de su presidente y su equipo aquí presente hoy por la organización de este gran coloquio que deseo ver en futuras ediciones y a quien deseo larga vida. Y para terminar, permítanme transmitirles a todos ustedes en esta feliz ocasión los mejores deseos de nuestro presidente, señor Mohamed Rashi. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, doctor El Petani. Doctora Guadalupe Valencia, 
coordinadora de Humanidades de la UNAM, eh, tiene usted el uso de la palabra y le pedimos también la declaratoria inaugural del evento. Será un gusto, muchísimas gracias, muy distinguidos y apreciados Abdel Fatah Levar, embajador del Reino de Marruecos en México, gran amigo de nuestra universidad. Mabel del Pilar Gómez Oliver, embajadora de México ante el Reino de Marruecos. Mohamed Dafir El Ketani, director interino del Instituto Universitario de Estudios Africanos, Euromediterráneos e Iberoamericanos de la Universidad Mohamed Quinta de Rabat. Muy bienvenido. Alicia Girón, coordinadora del Programa Universitario de Estudios sobre Asia y África de nuestra UNAM. Profesoras, profesores y especialistas del Reino de Marruecos invitados a este coloquio. Cautar El Amri, titular de la Cátedra Graciela Hierro de la Universidad Mohamed V de Rabat. Rayael Kansi, académica del Instituto Universitario de Estudios Africanos, Euromediterráneos e Iberoamericanos de la misma universidad y de la misma universidad Achoac Chalca, académica de, de este mismo instituto, Fátima E. Chavi, académica de la Universidad Ibn Sor, Rafael Esparza, académico de la Universidad de Las Palmas de Gran Canaria, Mohamed Ben Abdel Kader, analista especializado en comunicación y relaciones internacionales y exministro, Mochine Mounhid, presidente del Observatorio de América Latina en Marruecos. Gracias a todas y todos por atender a nuestra invitación. Sean muy bienvenidas y bienvenidos a la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México y en particular a esta que es la sede de la Coordinación de Humanidades. Funcionarios y colaboradores de la Embajada en México del Reino de Marruecos, directoras y directores académicos, nos acompaña el director del Estudio de Investigaciones Económicas, Armando Sánchez, agradezco su presencia. También del Centro de Investigaciones sobre América Latina y el Caribe, el doctor Hernán Tabuada, gracias por estar aquí. E integrantes de comunidades académicas de entidades de este subsistema y del UNAM, gracias también, no solo por su presencia, sino por su participación en actividades a las que damos inicio el día de hoy. En el mes de febrero de 2022, en ocasión de la jornada académica que realizó el doctor Enrique Luis Graue, rector de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, cuando fue distinguido en ceremonia solemne con el doctorado honoris causa de la Universidad Mohamed V de Rabat, expresó, como instituciones de educación superior debemos reforzar e incrementar la cooperación internacional y posicionarla en el diseño de soluciones para la construcción del acceso universal a la ciencia y a la educación, la justicia y el respeto a los derechos humanos en nuestras regiones. En el marco de aquella jornada académica se firmó el acuerdo de colaboración para la continuidad de las cátedras Fátima Merniz en la UNAM México y Graciela Hierro en la sede de la Mohamed Quinta. Ambas cátedras, espejo una de la otra, representan la posibilidad de mantener un amplio diálogo entre nuestras comunidades en torno a temas de alta importancia para nuestras sociedades, enfoques de género, derechos humanos e interculturalidad, entre muchos otros que convergen y o se derivan de ellos. La Cátedra Mernici en la UNAM se creó en febrero del 17 y tiene como objetivo propiciar un diálogo académico en torno a temas actuales de las sociedades árabes e iberoamericanas, tales como los derechos humanos, la concepción humanista de las mujeres y la igualdad de género, fomentando la difusión de estudios provenientes de ámbitos como la literatura, la sociología, la antropología, la cultura, la política y el derecho. Además de ser un espacio para la enseñanza y la reflexión en torno al legado de Fátima Mernice, nacida en Fez, académica de la Universidad Mohamed V de Rabat, escritora galardonada con el Príncipe de Asturias, y una de las figuras que consideramos es una de las más importantes para el pensamiento feminista contemporáneo marroquí. Para su implementación, la cátedra cuenta con un comité directivo en el cual participan varias entidades de nuestra UNAM. Durante sus seis años, los seis años que lleva en funcionamiento, ha logrado articular una amplia gama de actividades y espacios para el diálogo académico que le han permitido permanecer activa aún en la difícil etapa de restricciones sanitarias que recientemente vivimos. 
En el último año y medio ha sido importante el impulso que brindó Reina Carretero, su coordinadora, quien también es investigadora del CRIM UNAM. Y hacia el futuro estamos seguras de que el relevo de Alejandra Tapia, académica del Centro de Investigaciones y Estudios de Género, dará continuidad y fortalecerá en los próximos dos años las tareas de esta cátedra. Hemos hecho un espacio en el programa de actividades del día de mañana para hacer este relevo, el cual permitirá mantenerla activa y vigente aquí y allá como espejos transatlánticos. Entre los meses de septiembre y octubre del año pasado, tanto la coordinadora del PUEAA como yo tuvimos la oportunidad de llevar a cabo jornadas académicas y de trabajo con diferentes universidades, comunidades académicas, investigadores y directores de entidades de investigación en Marruecos. De igual forma, la doctora Alicia Girón estuvo presente en el inicio de los trabajos de la Cátedra Graciela Hierro de la Universidad Mohamed V. La multiplicidad de intereses académicos en común, que se reflejó en una amplia agenda de trabajo, nos permitió identificar de manera conjunta la pertinencia y viabilidad de realizar este coloquio que inauguramos el día de hoy y que comprende varias actividades entre hoy y el día de mañana. El viernes 28, el, desde el jueves 29, las actividades del coloquio se trasladan y se realizan en el marco de la Fiesta del Libro y la Rosa 2023, organizada por la UNAM en la, eh, a, a través de la UDIR en la Enés Morelia, con el auspicio de esta coordinación, y, y se realizará con el nombre, un nombre precioso, para, eh, que refleja mucho de la cultura marroquí, la ruta de los deseos, eh, que son los deseos de mayor vinculación, articulación, amistad y desde luego lectura mutua de textos de aquí y de allá. Esta ruta de los deseos que tiene al reino de Marruecos como país invitado y al escritor Alberto Ruiz Sánchez como homenajeado. Allí vamos a continuar nuestro diálogo ampliando el marco a los campos de la literatura y las ciencias y tendremos varias presentaciones de libros y un conversatorio. Deseo agradecer la tarea de los diferentes equipos de trabajo que han hecho posible concretar estas jornadas. Al equipo de la Embajada del Reino de Marruecos en México, encabezada por el señor embajador aquí presente y su ministro Mustafa Saquit, del Programa Universitario de Estudios sobre Asia y África a cargo de la doctora Alicia Girón, quien diseñó y coordinó el programa de este coloquio, desde luego eh, con su incansable colaboradora Vania eh, de la Vega y los otros colaboradores también. Mariana Macera, directora de la UDIR en la sede UNAM Morelia. Elise Speckman, directora del Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas, en donde se llevará a cabo una mesa. David García, director del Instituto de Investigaciones Filológicas, en donde habrá también una conversación entre eh, colegas marroquíes y mexicanos. También y de manera muy especial a los equipos de esta Coordinación de Humanidades que convergieron para hacer posible esta actividad, a Gabriela Ríos, secretaria académica, a Isabel García, nuestra secretaria administrativa. De manera muy especial agradezco al doctor Alberto Carrera, quien desde el inicio estuvo al tanto de toda la logística eh, eh, y surtiendo de muchas y muy buenas ideas a este esfuerzo. Muchas gracias a todas y todos quienes nos acompañan de manera presencial y a través del canal de YouTube de esta coordinación. Les pido por favor que nos pongamos de pie para decir que siendo las 10 de la mañana con tres minutos del miércoles 26 de abril del 2003 en esta sala del Consejo Técnico de Humanidades en Ciudad Universitaria, Ciudad de México, do, damos por inaugurados los trabajos del coloquio México y Marruecos, Espejos Transatlánticos, diálogos e intersecciones. Enhorabuena por la realización de esta actividad académica que nos une y que estoy segura que tendrá el mayor de los éxitos y que no será desde luego el último encuentro, sino apenas uno de los iniciales. Muchas gracias por su amistad, muchas gracias por estar aquí, bienvenidas, bienvenidos todos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias.
Muchas gracias a todas las autoridades académicas y diplomáticas que estuvieron en esta inauguración y por supuesto a la delegación de académicos marroquíes, autoridades universitarias y audiencia presencial y a distancia a quienes les invitamos a seguir eh, este coloquio y que no se muevan de sus lugares, ya sea eh, aquí en la sala o desde sus computadoras. Vamos a hacer un cambio de presidium para dar paso a eh, la conferencia magistral México and Morocco, Geopolitical and Geoeconomic Perspective. Y de manera paralela, a las 11 de la mañana, tenemos el eh, seminario en el Instituto de Investigaciones Filológicas. Y posteriormente, a las 12.45, tenemos la mesa Relaciones Diplomáticas entre Marruecos y América Latina. Y con eso acabamos el primer día de actividades. Muchas gracias a todos. Council of Arab Ambassadors to Canada 2015-2016. Dr. Chekruni was Minister for the Moroccan Community Living Abroad 2002-2007, a Member of Parliament 2002-2007, and the Minister for Women and Social Issues between 1998-2002. She holds a bachelor's degree from the Philological Faculty at the University of Fez, a postgraduate diploma, and a PhD in linguistics from the Université Sobor Nouvelle in, Par in Paris. Dr. Chekruni has also completed a certificate in ethics and international relations at Harvard University. She is 26 senior fellow in advanced leadership at Harvard University and has taught linguistics at the Faculty of Arts and Social Science at the University of Nex. Since 2020, Dr. Chekruni is a member of the Arab and Moroccan networks of women mediators of the United Nations agenda, women, peace, and security. Then I'm going to read the, the two uh, other CV. Here is Mohamed Dafir El Katani. He's interim director, Academic Institute of African, Euro-Mediterranean, and Ibero-American Studies. He graduated as an engineer in computer security from the Mohammedia School of Engineering and obtained a PhD in 2001 from the same school in collaboration with the Louis Pasteur Université in Strasbourg. He completed the senior management cycle in 2001 from the Higher Institute of Commerce and Business Administration. And in 2006, he obtained a master's degree in use of information and communication technologies for education and training from the Louis Pasteur Université again. He obtained many distinctions such as a prize for the Competition for Innovation, Research Development and Technology 2001, award in May 2002, and in 1997, the title of Honorary Major of the City of Baton Rouge, District of East Baton Rouge, the State of Louisiana, at the end of his official visit in the Young African Leaders Program. Author for four, four invention patents, he has several professional certifications in the world of governments and IT security, and in 20, since in June 2019, he was appointed interim director of the Institute of Studies and Research of the Arabization. Between June 2019 and September 21, he was interim director of the Institute of African Studies and the University Institute for Scientific Research. He was also between 2019 and September 2021, interim director of the Institute of Hispano Lusophone Studies as part of the major project of this last three institutes. Welcome, Professor Catani. And now I'm going to present Armando Sanchez. He holds a PhD in economics from the School of Economics, UNAM, a master's degree in economics from UNAM, a master of arts in economics from the Virginia Polytechnic Institute, and a bachelor degree in economics from Fesacatlan. He is currently a junior researcher in, in, in the, the highest in the highest level of our university. Of, uh, and it is, uh, he, is my, well, he is my chief of the Economic Research Institute, and she has uh, uh, also member of the uh, um, National Research System of Mexico. His research interests are poverty, climate change, energy, macroeconomics, industrial productivity, and economics. He is coordinator of the macroeconomic prospective analysis 
he received the National University Distinction for Young Academic and the National University Award in the teaching category in 2017. He obtained scholarships for research and updating internships from International University, the Ford Foundation and Grupo Santander. He has published articles in national and international repair and index journals such as Climate Change, Journal of the Science of Food and Agriculture, and Journal of International Money and Finance. He has done research stage and courses at Cambridge University, University of California, Brown University, Levy Institute, and the University of Pennsylvania. He has taught courses of, at, at the School of Economics and also in the, in the Graduate School of Economics and also in the Economic Research Institute and in Acatlan, France, Ecuador, and Costa Rica. Well, we will begin with, uh, with our, who, she is uh, with Nucha Chekruni, who will present the topic Morocco in the international context and its relation with the European Union. Uh, uh, I would like to, uh, if we can concentrate in no more than 20 minutes, so we will have a time for questions and answers. So Professor Chekruni, thank you very much. I'm so glad to see you, even by Zoom. I'm very happy, Nusha. Thank you very much to accept our invitation. And sorry that you aren't here, but I hope to visit, uh, that you will visit very soon, our UNAM. Thank you very much. Nusha, the floor is yours. I think your microphone. Your microphone is. Okay. Dear Professor Alicia Heron, coordinator of the University Program of Studies on Asia and Africa, distinguished professors, guests, and participants, buenos dias. It is a great pleasure for me to take part in this important colloquium organized by the University Program of Studies on Asia and Africa on the team. Mexico and Morocco transatlantic mirrors, dialogues, and intersections. My presentation will focus specifically, specifically on the issue of Morocco and its international context, geopolitical and economics perspective, by noting the similarities and common challenges of our two countries. As you said, uh, my dear professor, my name is Nusa Shikruni. I am senior fellow at the Policy Center for the New South. And I am speaking from Morocco on the other side of the Atlantic shore to, to participate in the construction of bridges of dialogue between our two countries to get to know each other better and explore avenues for cooperation and uh, challenges. Morocco and Mexico, despite being geographically distant, share several similarities in various aspects. Both countries hold unique geographical, political, and economic positions. Alongside their historical and cultural affinities, Morocco and Mexico are both emerging economies within their respective regions and share similar goals in terms of industrial development, foreign inv investment attraction, and expanding trade relations. Moreover, moreover, Morocco and Mexico are actively seeking to diversify their economies beyond their traditional sectors and develop new industries, such as renewable energy and technology. Additionally, other similarities can be pointed between the two countries in terms of their political landscapes, particularly with regards to South-South cooperation strategies, migration policies, and women's leadership. So let me uh, share with you some slides, and my presentation will be um, focusing on uh, three um, sections. Um, I'm sorry. So on three sections, history and culture. The second section is about economy. And I will talk about Moroccan and Mexican automotive industry, as well as Morocco and Mexico as a gateway economics for international trade and investment, Morocco's energy sector and its comparability to Mexico.
The third section will be about politics. I will talk about South-South cooperation policies as a key pillar in Morocco and Mexico's foreign policies, migration policies, and finally, the women's leadership. I will talk about Garcia Lahiro and Fatima Mernisi. So let's start about the history and culture. This aspiration for apportionment between Morocco and Mexico finds its foundations in our history and rich cultural heritage that it is reflected in the art, architecture, music, and cuisine. There are indeed similarities in Moroccan and Mexican architecture that can be traced by, back to the influence of Islamic art in the Iberian Peninsula in the 8th century. During the early Islamic period, the Moors, Muslim from North Africa, conquered the Iberian Peninsula. This resulted in a fusion of Islamic and European architectural pardon, architectural styles, which came to be known as Mudejar architecture. Mudejar architecture featured a distinctive blend of Islamic geometric patterns and motifs with European Gothic and Romanesque styles. These styles spread throughout the Iberian Peninsula and its influence was felt in both Morocco and Mexico. In Morocco, the influence of Modejar architecture can be seen in the use of ornate tile work and intricate geometric pattern in buildings such as the Hassan II Mosque in Casablanca and the Madrasa al Buenania in Fez. Similarly, in Mexico, Modejar architecture can be seen in the use of ornate tile work and intricate patterns in buildings such as the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City and the Templo Mayor in sorry, Tenochtitlan, uh, now uh, Mexico City. Overall, the influence of Islamic art on Mudejar architecture played a significant role in shaping the architectural styles of both Morocco and Mexico, and the similarities between the two can be attributed to this shared history. When it comes to econom economic aspects, Morocco and Mexico have emerged as significant players in the global automotive industry, with both countries experiencing remarkable growth in their automotive sectors in recent years. Mexico is the seventh largest producer of motor vehicles and the fifth largest exporter of cars in the world, 2021 data. The automotive sector accounts for a significant share of the country's GDP, 3.5%. In contrast, Morocco's automotive industry is re relatively new, but it has grown rapidly in recent years and is now the largest car producer in Africa. Both countries have a strong focus on producing vehicles for export. Mexico is the world's fifth largest export exporter of cars. 90% of its automotive production is exported, with 76% destined to the US uh, United States. Morocco also focuses on exporting its vehicles, and the country has it established its Europe. In Morocco, the automotive industry has become one of the country's fastest growing sectors, contributing significantly to its economic growth and exports. Morocco has leveraged its strategic location, competitive labor costs, and favorable business environment to attract automotive investments. The sector primarily focuses on vehicle manufacturing and auto parts production with major global automotive manufacturers establishing production facilities in the country. In Morocco, the automotive sector has been identified as a priority sector for development under the country's industrial acceleration plan. Under this plan, the Moroccan government has implemented several measures to promote the development of its automotive industry. These measures include creating a favorable, favorable business environment. These measures include simplified administrative procedures, uh, streamlined customs procedures, and the establishment of specialized industrial zones. Developing 
skilled also workforce. Morocco has established a comprehensive training and education system to provide the automotive industry's workforce with the necessary skills and knowledge. The system includes vocational training program partnership with universities and research centers, centers and the development of specialized training centers. Also tax incentives and encouraging also research and development and also promoting exports, Morocco has implemented several measures to promote the export of vehicles and automotive components, including the establishment of free trade agreements with key markets and the creation of dedicated export promotion agency. Today, Morocco is home to several automotive manufacturing plants, including Renault, PSA, Peugeot and Citroën, and Ford, which export vehicles mainly to the European market. Similarly, Mexico has a long-standing history in the automotive industry. Mexico's automotive sector has experience, experienced significant growth over the past decade, uh, becoming the seventh largest producer. Mexico's proximity to the United States and access to its markets have been a key driver of the country's success in the automotive industry. Also, Morocco and Mexico, they are gateway economics and international trade and investment. Both Morocco and Mexico have adopted an open economic policy and established strong economic and trade relationships with major global players. The U European Union is Morocco's leading trade partner, accounting for 59.4% uh, of Morocco's export and 49% of its import in 2021. The EU is also the biggest foreign investor in Morocco, accounting for more than half of the country's FDI stock. Morocco's main exports to the European Union include automotive parts, textile, phosphates, and agricultural products. Additionally, Morocco benefits from its proximity to Europe, which provides access to European markets and facilitates trade and investment. One of the most important opportunities of the economic partnership between Morocco and the EU is the development of Morocco's manufacturing industries and particularly in the automotive and aerospace sector. Morocco has attracted significant foreign investment in these industries with many European companies setting up production facilities in the country to take advantage of its competitive labor costs and strategic location. Similarly, Mexico has also been a key player in the global economy, particularly in its relationship with the United States and Canada through the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. One of the major opportunities of Mexico through NAFTA has been increased trade with its North American neighbors. NAFTA has created massive markets with combined GDP of over $20 trillion, making it one of the largest trading blocks in the world. Furthermore, NAFTA has facilitated the integration of regional supply chains, particularly in the automotive sector. Mexico has become a key player in the global automotive industry. Many automotive companies have established production facilities in Mexico to take advantage of the tariff-free access to the United States and Canadian markets. This, is, this has result, resulted in the creation of jobs and the development of a robust automotive ecosystem in Mexico, contributing to the country's economic growth. What are the common points between Morocco and Mexico when it comes to the energy sector? I will point out at least five points. The energy mix. Both Morocco and Mexico have diversified energy mixes that include fossil fuels, renewable energy sources, and nuclear power. Energy security. Both countries face challenges in ensuring energy security, especially in the face of external shocks such as oil price fluctuations or geopolitical instability. 
Energy access. While both Morocco and Mexico have made progress in improving energy access for their population, there are still areas in both countries where access to modern energy services is limited. Energy policy. Both countries have implemented energy policies aimed at promoting a renew renewable energy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and increasing energy efficiency and energy investments. Both countries have attracted significant investment in their energy sectors from domestic and foreign sources. The electricity sector reforms and how it's comparable also to the Moroccan experience. Mexico federal government and Morocco central government have traditionally played an important role in the domestic market via their management of economic policies and their extensive reach in some sectors of the economy. Recent administrations has followed prudent and credible economic policies that fostered a stable investment climate while maintaining government control over certain industries. The two countries have many lessons to share in terms of electricity sector reform and energy transition choices and their impact on the regional integration. The transition of the power sector in Morocco has been a crucial factor in the country's economic growth, creating numerous opportunities for development. Although reforms have been made in the electricity sector of the years, private sector involvement has been gradual and limited, despite this ONI has remained a dominant and vertically integrated public utility that serves as a single byte and the transmission system operator and owns a portion of the distribution network. In terms of best practices and lessons learned, what can these countries exchange? About the energy transi transition, there are opportunities and setbacks for Morocco and Mexico. Morocco has been promoting itself as a, a trailblazer in energy transition, boosting initiatives such as banning plastic bags and establishing the world's largest solar park. However, despite setting a goal of 42% share of renewable energy capacity by 2020, several policy setbacks prevented Morocco from achieving it. Despite these challenges, both countries have taken strides toward energy transition 2.0. In Mexico, there is a growing interest in the development of critical metal for electric vehicle batteries, particularly lithium. The government passed legislation in April 2022 that recognizes Mexico's lithium reserves, the world ninth largest as a matter of national strategic importance. Morocco renewable energy and commitments in the COP27. As part of its nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement, Morocco has set an ambitious goal of reducing the GHG emission by more than 45% by 2030. This commitment is not just a statement, it is already being put into action. Morocco's NDC includes around 60 action and measures primarily focused on your renew renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. These projects will contribute to 60% of the total targeted GHG emission reductions. The renewable energy sector has become a carrier of wealth for Morocco, improving human welfare and social equity while significantly reducing environmental risks and resource scarcity. In the past two years, Morocco has invested heavily in renewable energy and aims to exceed 52% in the energy mix by 2030. The same Mexico in a joint news conference at COP27, Mexican Ministry of Foreign Affairs Marcelo Ebrard and US Special Presidential Envoy John Kerry announced that Mexico intends to deploy more than 20 additional gigawatts of renewable power generation capacity, wind, solar, geothermal and hydropower by 2030. Also about solar energy potential, 
Both Morocco and Mexico are investing in renewable energy to reduce their dependence on fossil, fossil fuels and to mitigate climate change. Morocco has a high solar energy potential due to its favorable climatic conditions and high level of solar radiation. Currently, produces 4,000 um, megawatts from renewable energy out of total generating capacity of 11,000 megawatts, making it one of the most favorable countries in the world for solar energy. The solar energy potential in Morocco varies depending on the region. Morocco has several large-scale solar projects, such as the Nur Warzazat complex, which is one of the largest concentrated solar power plants in the world. And Mexico also has a high solar energy potential due to its favorable climatic condition and high level of solar uh, radiation. Mexico has several large-scale solar projects, such as Villa Nueva Solar Park, which is one of the largest solar photovoltaic power plants in the world. Coming to the political aspects, the third part, in terms of partnership with the North, our two trajectories meet. Morocco is linked to the European Union by a partnership framework that is constantly being renewed and which was consolidated in October 2022 by establishing cooperation in terms of environmental protection, biodiversity, conservation and the fight against climate change with the launch of the Green Partnership. For its part, Mexico is linked to its North American neighbors by the North, uh, North American Free, Free Trade Agreement, uh, NAFTA. Morocco is also oriented towards South-South cooperation and is fully involved in its African continent. In addition to question of development, peace and security, the migration issue constitutes a human dimension and poses new challenges. ZLECAF is the zone of three free ag agreements between African countries, is promising new framework for the development of a large intra-African market. Morocco has sought to deepen its partnership with African countries through bilateral agreements, trade partnership and diplomatic engagement within the African Union framework. Morocco has also supported the African Union's Agenda 2063, which focuses on promoting sustainable development, regional integration, and African unity. In addition to its engagement with the AU, Morocco has also established bilateral partnership with several African countries to promote cooperation in various uh, sectors. For example, Morocco has developed strong economic ties with countries such as Senegal, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and Ethiopia, among others. Morocco has also implemented several development projects in Africa as part of its South-South cooperation effort. The Moroccan Agency of International Cooperation has been instrumental in implement implementing this project, which focus on areas such as agriculture, water management, renewable energy, and health. We have just for instance, the rehabilitation of Cocodile Bay project in Abidjan, the establishment of fertilizer production units in Ethiopia and Nigeria, and the launch of the Morocco Nigeria gas pipeline project, etc. Mexico has also established various mechanisms and initiatives to promote South South cooperation in Latin America and beyond, including bilateral agreements, regional organization and multilateral uh, platforms. Mexico has also supported various development projects and programs in Latin America through bilateral agreements, uh, with the, like uh, provide technical assistance and funding for renewable energy projects in countries like Nicaragua, Nicar Nicaragua and Honduras, and has supported social development programs in countries like Guatemala and El Salvador. In recent years, Morocco and Mexico have de deepened their bilateral relations and strengthened their cooperation in various fields. They have signed numerous agreements to promote trade investment and technical cooperation, 
and have exchanged visits at the highest level to enhance political dialogue and explore new areas of cooperation. For example, in 2020, Morocco and Mexico signed a Memorandum of Understanding on Economic and Trade Cooperation, which aims to promote bilateral trade and investment and explore opportunities in areas such as agriculture, tourism, and the renewable energy. They have also cooperated in international forums, such as the UN and the Global Forum on Migration and Development to promote dialogue and cooperation on issues related to migration and refugees. Finally, migration, it's one of the main similarities between Morocco and Mexico, and it's uh, both countries are uh, countries of origin and of transit of migrants and have adopted a humanist approach to migration as it is not in understood as a security issue but as a hum humanitarian one. Mexican and Moroccan governments have been under pressure by the US and the European Union member state to increase border control and internal policy to curb migration flows. Due to the rise of global inequality, political, social, and economic changes, the approach to dealing with migration has become heavily politicized. Borders have now become violent and increasingly polarized frontiers to deter migrants from crossing them, which has led Morocco and Mexico to no longer be perceived by migrants as transit countries, but rather as potential countries in which they want to settle. Since 2013, Morocco has adopted a humanist approach to migration to desecretize the issue and has become a nation of hosting asylum, asylum seekers, irregular migrants, foreign students, refugees, etc. A year later, Morocco adopted the national migration and asylum strategy, which provided a holistic approach to the different challenges posed by immigration, including humanitarian integration, foreign policy and governance, and economic, cultural and social challenge. Since then, approximately, approximately 50,000 irregular migrants were regularized. In a similar vein, in 2014, Mexico has also adopted the South Border Program, a comprehensive program aimed at controlling migration flows while guaranteeing the integrity and the respect of migrants. Excuse me, Dr. Chow. Yes? You only have two minutes to conclude, please. Okay, so I will finish on a note of women leadership. On October 19, 2022, uh, the Garcia La Hierro Chair was inaugur inaugurated at the University Institute of African, Euro-Mediterranean and Ibero-American Studies of Mohammed V University in Rabat, Morocco. The inauguration coincided with the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Morocco and Mexico, and it comes three years after the inauguration of the Fatima Mernissi Chair at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. I would like to highlight how important it is that the names of these two women were chosen by the two universities for their respective chairs. It is not only about their crucial contribution to understanding power structures, but also how patriarchal conception maintains social injustice and remain an obstacle to democracy. They argued, Fatma Mernissi and Garciella, argued that feminist movement in known Western countries needed to be grounded in local tradition, traditions and values and consider the specific cultural and historical context of each society. Both emphasized the importance of democracy. Mernissi and Hero believed that democracy was critical to promoting social justice and gender equality. They were critical for authoritarian regimes and called for democratic reforms that would ensure the representation and participation of all members of society, including women. Mernissi and Hero's work focused on issues of social justice, including poverty, inequality, and discrimination. They argued that feminist movements needed to address 
these broader issues to promote gender equality and social justice. To conclude, we live in a fragmented work, world in constant and unpredictable change. Barely out of COVID-19, we had to face the follow-up from the Russian-Ukrainian war combined with climate change with disastrous consequences on water stress and agriculture, in addition to the prospects of global financial crisis. The challenges are both considerable and numerous. It is by pooling our efforts and supporting each other that the New South will establish itself as a balanced entity in an unbalanced world. Morocco is determined to continue its march towards progress and democracy while defining its southern provinces and its territorial integrity. He will continue to consolidate South-South cooperation through inclusive development projects and advocate for climate justice and sustainable peace and security. This symposium offers a great opportunity for a dialogue between two countries, Morocco and Mexico, located on both sides of the Atlantic Basin. Morocco and Mexico, two countries with a millennial history and an ancestral culture, they have a lot to share, they face the same challenges and can be influential players and contribute to efforts to build a prosperous and peaceful area around the Atlantic. Thank you for your attention. Lucia, thank you very much. He has, he has given the, the principal issues of this conference. We are very happy to have you here. And now I'm going to give the floor to Professor Mohamed Afir El Kitani. He will present the topic, Development Dynamics in Morocco and Mexico, a Global Studies Approach. Professor Kitani, you have the floor. Thank you, respected Professor uh, Alisa Heron, coordinator of the University Program for Asian and African Studies. Excellency, Mr. Abdelkader, uh, Minister. Excellency, Mrs. Uh, uh, Musa Shukroni, uh, Minister. Respected directors, coordinators, directors of programs. Respected auditors, professors, and colleagues. Next, please. Uh, let me uh, present to you the agenda of uh, my presentation, uh, which will deal with, with the development dynamics that are uh, connecting potentially Mexico and, and Morocco. So the agenda is the following, after a brief introduction, where I will try to reframe the subject related to geopolitics and geoeconomic, and address it as a development dynamics problem. And a global solution question. And then I will uh, refer shortly to a reminder to the history that links, the common history that links Morocco and Mexico. Then I will uh, uh, deduce from uh, geopolitics and geoeconomics uh, ideas a compared analysis between Morocco and Mexico. And then uh, in the second uh, part, I will uh, try to uh, deduce from it, from this compared analysis, some dynamic issues between both countries and point out the weaknesses of that empiric approach. Then as a, a consequence of this uh, reflection, I will try to move from a geopolitics and geoeconomics approach into a geostrategical one concerning the, the orientations uh, based on a global studies approach. And then I will conclude. So let me first address the problem that I will discuss about 
by introducing the obsidian mirror of John Dee in the 15th century. And uh, John Dee is an astrologer of uh, Queen Elizabeth I, and he's one of the most famous objects in the Gallery of Light at the British Museum in London. Uh, concerning this mirror, which is very special, a recent X-ray analysis shows that John Dee's mirror was indeed made with obsidian of Mexican origin coming from Pachuca, an extraction site within Aztec territory. And a and metaphorical reading of the title of this colloquium, Transatlantic Mirrors, this mirror refers and alludes to the deep cultural interaction between civilization living in the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. This cultural exchange, in my opinion, should constitute the basis of any economic or political interaction which leads today to geopolitical and geoeconomic matters. So, although both countries differ in many aspects, Mexico and Morocco share common historical profiles. The colonial heritage is for both, not without consequences on our both <coughs> modern histories, as evidenced by the intensity of trade, investment, <coughs> and aid flows, which have been favored by North American regional integration agreements, the NAC in occurrence, and the European Union agreements for Morocco, but also the importance of migration between these regions of the world. Also, anthropological and sociological comparisons between these two regions will show many common points. So, uh, the first point concerned geopolitics and geoeconomics. Well, so, let me just uh, remind the definition of both. Geopolitics can be defined as the struggle over the control of geographical entities with an international and global dimension, and the use of just geographical entities for political, political advantage. Anyway, geoeconomics can be defined as the study of the economic trends and conditions of the world's countries and how they are related on the global scale in a global perspective. And it is understood as the use of economic tools to advance geopolitical objectives. So I will not go very far in this complete analysis because Professor Alisa Giron gave a lot of statistics in the introduction and also the ministry, Dusash Khroni, give also many uh, very rich information. So just I will highlight on what has not been uh, said. Concerning the geographical uh, comparison, we can say that Mexico is between three or four times bigger uh, than uh, Morocco in the area, uh, in uh, uh, population from a demographical viewpoint, uh, but density, population growth, life expectancy, literary rate are quite the same. They differ very uh, shortly from one to another, but we both have uh, many languages, which is pointing out the, this diversity of culture, and uh, we have our official language, of course. Uh, let's point out that in Morocco, we have 7 million uh, people who speak Spanish. Uh, this is uh, um, the statistic of uh, 2019. Concerning, concerning internal policy, Morocco is strengthening its stability and making it a priority. We have political, economical, and social modernization of the country with major, major sectoral plans, reform of the family code, and social protection, and progress in electronic, electoral transparency. In 2006, the report of the Equity and Reconciliation Commission instituted by the King Mohammed VI was a milestone. And of adoption of new con constitution in July uh, 2011 referendum clarified the relationship and strengthened the role of the head of government and parliament. Uh, also to address inequalities, King Mohammed VI 
has made the country's development as a national priority. And in November 2019, he sets up a special commission for development who submitted her report on May 2021. In order to contain also the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, Morocco quickly implemented strict measures and closure of borders in spring uh, 2020, and again in autumn to, uh, 2021 until February 2022, establishment of a state of health emergency and confinement until July 2020. And Morocco is distinguished by a voluntarist and remarkably effective vaccination campaign. On the other hand, for Mexico, uh, we assisted to general elections in 2018, which were marked by the landslide victory of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in the presidential election. And the Morena party won along with the parties of the Junto Haremos Historia coalition, the legislative elections and five federal states government out of the nine subject to election. The magnitude of this victory and election for the first time of a president claiming to be left-wing gave this election a, a historic dimension. Also, the next federal elections will be held uh, in around one year, which will be legislative, presidential, and local elections. Also, the Mexican president has made the fight against corruption, insecurity, and inequality the priority of a program called Forced Transformation of Mexico in reference to independence, liberal reform, and Mexican revolution in the early uh, 20th century. And also the celebration in 2021 of the bicentenary of Mexican independence, the 500th anniversary of the founding of ancient Mexico Tenochtitlan, and the 300th anniversary of its conquest by Spain were a highlight of public life in Mexico. Concerning the foreign of, uh, policy, Africa is, uh, for Morocco, Africa is a priority for Moroccan diplomacy. Morocco intends to extend its economy and political influence on the continent, in particular via the numerous African tours of King Mohammed VI. Morocco is counting on the investments of its major groups on the continent, in particular Maroc Telecom and Atijari Wafa Bank. More than 30 years after withdrawing from the African Union in 1984, Morocco rejoined the African Union in 2017. And Morocco sat on the Council of Peace and Security Officer, officer from uh, 2018 and 2020 and was elected in February 2022 for a further three-year term. Also, Morocco hosts the Confucius Institute in Rabat, the most important in Africa. And from 2000 and 2012, the media report, no less than 36 Chinese participations in the financing of projects in Morocco. Morocco strengthened also and institutionalized its ties with the Gulf countries uh, and the Morocco maintains a regular political dialogue with the United States, with which it concluded a free trade agreement with, which entered into force in 2006, as well as a strategic dialogue, Morocco being a mayor non-NATO ally. The Trump administration has prompted a rapprochement between the two countries through the recognition of Moroccan sovereignty on over Western Sahara. On the other hand, in Mexico, the United States remains the first political and economic partner of Mexico. The United States, where more than 11 million Mexicans reside who send $50 billion in remesas remittances in 2021, which is a destination for more than eight 80% of Mexico's foreign trade. Also, Mexico has taken advantage of the Sino-American rivalry to consolidate its status as the United States' largest trading partner while attracting Chinese investment. The bilateral relationship 
remains marked by immigration issues, with Mexico calling for greater U.S. investment in development projects in marginalized regions of Central America to prevent immigration. The search for a, divers, a diversification of external partners in order to get out of an overlaid exclusive relationship with the United States remains a priority for Mexican diplomacy. And as a Latin American power, Mexico exercised the pro temporary presidency of the, the community of Latin American and Caribbean states for two years and organized the sixth summit of CELAC heads of state of government in Mexico City in uh, 2021. And it is also a member of various regional organizations such as the OAS, the Association of Caribbean States, and the Pacific Alliance. Also in uh, foreign policy, Morocco was a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council for two years since uh, 2012 and until 2013, Biennium, and he had already served twice on the Security Council during 1963, 1964, and 1922 to 1993. Morocco is also a major contributor to United Nations peacekeeping operation, deploying 1,702 blue helmets to two peacekeeping cooperation, Congo and the Central African Republic, with two experts in support of UNMIS in South Sudan. Morocco also addresses uh, 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 climate change with organizing COP22 uh, in uh, Marrakesh in uh, 2016. And with the European Union, Spain also has a very close relationship with Morocco, both economically, since Morocco's leading supplier since 2012 and ahead of China and France. And in the fight against terrorism and the fight against irregular immigration. At last, Morocco has evolved from a transit migration country into a host country. Um, on the other hand, for Mexico, it's, Mexico is a founding member, member of the United Nations. It defends a position inspired by its at attachment to the peaceful settlement of disputes and international law and to its non-interventionist diplomatic tradition called Estrada Doctrine. And Mexico was elected for the fifth time in its history as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council for the Biennium 2021 to 2022. Also, Mexico is a member of the G20 and the OECD, and is a co-chair in 2021, the, climate, the Green Climate Fund, and Mexico has joined also many initiatives like the Alliance for the Protection of Tropical Forests and the Global Partnership for Artificial Intelligence. The relations between Mexico and European Union fall within the framework of the economic partnership, political coordination, and cooperation agreement signed in 1997 and entered into force in 2000 and is currently being modernized. Uh, and also, uh, Mexico has evolved from a transit migration country into a host country. So, another uh, way to make this compared analysis is to focus on economic situation. Most of uh, the statistic has been uh, announced before by uh, Professor Alisa Heron and Minister Nusa Shkroni. I will only insist on the fact that the uh, government has announced for 2021 the first measure to implement the high guidelines of the king for the, generaliz the generalization of social protection and the reform of the public sector in order to improve the social inclusion of the Moroccan development model and to increase the role of the private sector following the recommendation of the World Bank in April 2018. And, uh, the King re regularly underlines the ambition to make Morocco an emerging and pioneer on the continent. Morocco has thus decided to supplement its free zone system in Tangier, in Tangier and its sectoral de development plans with a regional development dynamic towards sub-Saharan Africa in order to find new sources of growth. 
and uh, from a political, commercial, cultural, and spiritual viewpoint, the anchoring of Morocco in Africa today takes, takes on an increasingly prominent economic, social, and human aspect. This is the result of a global strategy aimed at the continent, initiated a decade ago, and which really needs the threads of a centuries old influence. On the other hand, for Mexico, world economy and 10th, uh, uh, Mexico is the 15th world economy and the 10th industrial power and the second economic power in Latin America after Brazil. So after this uh, comparison, we can guess some dynamic issues. In terms of alliances, the Atlantic Ocean represents a strategic space for prosperity and the common thinking in order to settle a certain dynamic for upcoming decades. African Atlantic States Alliance uh, initiated in Morocco uh, on June 2022, uh, and which is a Moroccan initiative, has a multiple dimension since it sets up a common vision of the space constituted by the African state of the Atlantic shore with as, as a base the emerging of an Atlantic identity with the continent against the North on the one, on the one hand and um, uh, insisting on this Moroccan diplomacy based on all out South-South cooperation. On the other hand, Pacific Alliance uh, regrouping Ch Chile, Chile uh, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru uh, will, will uh, uh, make a trade block initiated in 2011, combining population of more than uh, 230 million people and making up roughly 35% of Latin American GDP. So we have many opportunities since, for example, in, in Mexico, uh, its airport system is one of the most dy dynamic in Latin America, confirming its position as a regional logistic platform. Uh, Mexico is also a vast internal market of nearly 130 million inhabitants, which is the 11th in the world. Uh, and uh, also, Mexico has natural resources, and it's the first silver producer in the world, and the 11th oil producer. Uh, but we have some structural weaknesses, which are always opportunities. First one is uh, the Mexican economy, which represents opportunities for foreign companies that needs mainly in the training of equally qualified labor, depending on the sectors and region, or improving the productivity of the industry. And also, sprays by the international companies, Mexico remains one of the main gateways to Latin America and the United States. For Morocco, on the other hand, since even though we have more uh, small, smaller than Mexico, but we have important assets as the gate to Africa at the political, economical, and industrial levels. For example, the Nigeria-Morocco gas pipeline is one of the flagship projects linking the two countries and the national company of Petrol invested in uh, Nigeria invested over $12 billion uh, in gas pipeline. So the question is, why not to find similar projects from an economical and social impact between Mexico and Morocco or between corresponding regions? How to, how to identify such projects? What are the promising key sectors? What is the distance, uh, despite the distance which is so far from a geographical viewpoint, uh, what can we do? Is there a way to better position everyone through bilateral and regional collaborations, such as technologies, agriculture, science, education, healthy, sustainable development, clean energy, and so on? It is very difficult to approach without a global way in uh, thinking about development of dynamics. So, we need to have a systemic approach. So that's why I, uh, I go to the third and last uh, part. We need a framework for designing and drafting a roadmap, which leads strategic and political decisions 
based on an intrasectorial and intersectorial deep analysis concerning many uh, uh, steps, which are economic, health, education, tourism, and culture. And this is not globalization. It's a case-by-case -case analysis, looking after each detail that would constitute an interest in the puzzle of the society. For example, if we make the comparison with the Anglo-Saxon education system, um, this system is, it offers a more inductive universe where one observes and then deduces something. It is essential here to cultivate the, the natural curiosity of each student and emphasizing research and uh, making or creating the pleasure of learning experience and interdisciplinarity. So we have to, to uh, follow the same approach concerning, concerning the development of dynamics with a new age of ambition from geoeconomics and geopolitical competition into a geo strategy. But how to do it? It will be through global studies. So approaching the, 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 the geo strategy, let's take the example of a country continuing to sustain global military predominance, but that appears to be losing some overseas political and economic influence in a number of regions due to the rise of emerging powers. The question is how to remain uh, with a new form of policy of polycentrism for global governance that could help, help this country. And we are looking after a framework that generally seeks to examine multiple systematic systemic factors that affect global decision-making processes, not to overlook the forces of globalization as they have impacted upon more traditional analysis. And that's what global studies do with. The purpose is to examine development, poverty, inequality, as well as social, political, environmental, and cultural changes from a multidisciplinary perspective and it should focus on topics such as the theory of, of development, the global extractivism, and the transformating alternatives. And it will seek to explain and, under, and understand complex social transformation first and foremost, although not only in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America, as well as in the global south approach. So this will be a multidisciplinary research uh, through global studies. And uh, my guess is that uh, here in Monterey, we ha you have a, a center for global studies, uh, which can uh, uh, launch this such a process. Uh, I will uh, end with, uh, I will conclude. So with uh, many research projects that can be done in that, uh, uh, in that field and say that beyond the geopolitical and geoeconomic considerations, a geostrategic multidimensional analysis of development dynamics in both Mexico and Morocco, dealing with cultural, migratory, sociological, economic, historical, and even anthropological characters remains important. And by highlighting similarities and differences, strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats, this particular open and transversal approach in the apprehension of situations will allow both countries to benefit from the experiences of each other. And will, it will also make it possible to identify joint centers of interest for both nations in order to build together in the era of alliances an economy gaining in robustness with a regional and global impact. That's what we call global studies. And the, this will be despite geographical distance. So, uh, the key tool to, in order to implement such strategy efficiently is the use of modern technologies like artificial intelligence, high volume assets like big data, and uh, new sciences that uh, deal with data science uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, I will uh, close my uh, intervention with uh, coming back to uh, that uh, obsidian mirror which is still today. And it's widely believed that the obsidian is a protective stone that shields against negative energy. And given its sharpness, the stone is considered to pierce into darkness to reveal the truth itself 
that maybe it will be the way to arrive to the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Katani. Thank you, Professor Katani. Uh, you have sent us a big, big uh, quest, uh, uh, statement that this is uh, the global studies. And of course, as we are from the global south, it is very important to make this uh, great comparison that you have done. Uh, now we have uh, uh, the Dean of the Economic Research Institute. Uh, he, he will present the topic, Mexico and Morocco, perspectives on a stronger economic relationship in a globalized world. We have the floor. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Dear authorities, dear colleagues, professors, and community. I want to thank to Alicia Giron for inviting me to make this presentation and for making a reality together where people closer, the two countries in this kind of uh, events. In fact, what is important to make two countries to collaborate is by generating interactions. The interactions are really important and these kind of events are promoting that. So that's why um, I'm very glad to be here because I know that from these kind of events, we will make a reality, future collaborations and perhaps future uh, joint projects between our two nations. So uh, congratulations for this event. Um, the disadvantage of being the last presenter is that everyone has been discussed. Uh, the, um, the data has been presented. I had a long presentation with uh, a lot of data about Mexico and Morocco, but I'm going to skip that. So I I'm just want, in this case, I, I just want to make a reflection on the future perspectives and the relationships we can start and some questions on how we can make that a reality. So I'm going to skip the, the, the similarities. I just want to say that uh, as uh, my colleagues have said, Mexico and Morocco have significant historical, economic and cultural similarities and differences. Uh, this is like uh, the basic conditions to, to start a good collaboration between the two countries. Uh, the, we are similar, we are developing countries. We, have a, we are collaborating with, in, in our case, with uh, big nations like the United States and the European Union. That provides us an, an advantage in terms of uh, trade agreements that we can use in order to, to generate the economic conditions to, a, to have a better collaboration, but also to improve our economic performance of both nations. And if we do that uh, jointly, we can improve not only our economies, but also the way we are uh, having relationships. I'm gonna skip the, the data. Uh, it's a, there is a, a background here. Mexico and Morocco have already signed a general cooperation agreement. I think that is an advantage and it's a necessary condition to start new agreements and to start a new cooperation. So what we can think here is that uh, the commercial relationships that are actually uh, uh, running, we can improve them, improve that by, by uh, starting more interactions. And uh, I think that um, the integration and cooperation will work through these kind of events. As uh, my previous colleagues have said, uh, we have opportunities in trade, in energy, 
in cultural edu and education, uh, the geopolitical relationships are working well, but they can be even more, uh, have more improvement. I want to say, to conclude my presentation, that there is some necessary conditions to make people work together or two nations to work together. I think that Morocco and Mexico have that, that, those conditions. Uh, in the economy, we have, we have seen that, we have discussed that. We have these similarities. We have do, those stroke backgrounds that, ca that can constitute these basic conditions to start up a deeper collaboration. But I think that um, the sufficient conditions to make that relations deeper, deep relationships are, are needed to be constructed, are needed to, to build, to need to be built. And uh, I think that it, the way to work on that is to create the incentives. As an economist, I think that uh, the incentives are important. In the first place, the economic incentives, uh, I think, are going to appear once we um, generate the conditions to, to make our pro, uh, producer, producers closer, to make our consumers closer, to generate the interactions, and also to generate this kind of uh, politic uh, agreements and this kind of uh, meetings, we can start generating and get, making our different actors closer. In this case, this is a good example because the academic, academics are getting closer are discussing, discussing the main problems, the economic problems, and that's a, a sufficient condition to, to make academy closer and to de develop maybe academic projects together. But we need to make that a conditions realized a, for different sectors, for the industry, for the agriculture, for the politics. So this is a good example of how to do that. Uh, in order to conclude, I would like to say that there are several areas in which we, we can cooperate and benefit from, from a closer relationship. Increased trade, energy cooperation, cultural exchange, and geopolitical relations. So what we need to do is to, is to start doing it by generating these interactions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Armando Sanchez, for these great reflections. Of course, uh, this uh, this seminar that it is by the um, uh, bajo the umbrella of Fatima Mernici and Graciela Hierro, it's incredible that these uh, two women, uh, these feminist uh, uh, women, uh, invite us to these reflections, and that's why we are here in this colloquium. So uh, I'm going to give the floor. If there are some questions or there are some comments uh, you would like to share or you would like to ask. Also, uh, Professor uh, Misha Chikruni, if you would like to make a comment and then, uh, or go ahead, please. The, your microphone. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alicia. It, it was just great to be with you, even uh, very far from Mexico. Uh, but uh, I, I've i seen how uh, close we are. Uh, I heard uh, Dr. Kteni, I heard uh, your presentation, both of you, and I see how similarities are. So let's focus on the future with a positive vision and with the will a very strong will. I think we share this will to build on this all what we have uh, achieved since a long time. But we have a dream now is to go forward and to make Mexico and Morocco closer. And I, I agree absolutely with you. 
making that start by making people closer to uh, meet and to know uh, each other, uh, our history, our culture, our emotions, and share a lot. Uh, I, I think that this is a starting point, uh, and I believe that it's not the last meeting, but only the first one. And thank you again for uh, having me. Thank you very much. Of course, this is not the first meeting. We will have more meetings. Um, of course, we must be more close because we are very similar. Even uh, yesterday, I was with one, one of my colleagues, one of my students, and I, told, and I told her, you can be a Moroccan as the same as me. We can be Moroccans because we are very similar in our skin, in our faces, whatever. Uh, Professor uh, Ketani, would you like to say something? Thank you very much. Alicia. Uh, I would like to, to, um, to mention that, uh, of course, we are very similar. Uh, we are uh, um, converging to the same conclusions for the three presentations, and this is uh, uh, a reality. Um, I hope that uh, we will be able to organize all this with a real roadmap that we will be uh, organizing the work for a decade at least. Thank you very much. Yes, and of course, have more uh, young people and construct uh, that peace, which is very important in this moment. Professor uh, Armando Sanchez, would you like to say something mm -hmm. before you leave? Yes, uh, that, that I congratulate for this uh, colloquium. I think that you are going to be uh, very successful in, pre in the presentations, uh, making the knowledge close to people and close to researchers and, and that's that's it they got good luck with the with the work thank you uh, so uh, I will have if somebody would like to make some comments here in the in the floor and I don't know if we can have some questions that are in, in YouTube or or in Facebook I don't know if they are some questions um, Mitch or but here would you like to make some comments? Maybe you can do it in, in, in Spanish and well, we work on Professor Catania understands very well Spanish. Professor Esparza, I think you want to talk something. Thank you, and Professor Mohamed. Muy bien. Embajadora. Thank you very much for the speakers for uh, their presentations. We are very uh, broad and provide uh, a, a great basis to uh, follow up on specific issues that you uh, touched upon. I, I think that, uh, as, as has been mentioned, uh, the exchange of uh, academics and this kind of discussion that we're having in the context of the colloquium are very uh, useful for, um, pro to provide uh, a dialogue and to um, make closer the uh, Moroccan and the Mexican academics. But we have to go further. And uh, many of your comments focus on the economic similarities. And I think that, that that's a major, major potential which has been uh, under um, considered. And um, in that regard, I think that uh, not only the governments, but also the private sectors should um, uh, focus on how to uh, make synergies given that we have developed similar uh, sectors, just as the automotive has been mentioned in agriculture, we have a lot of uh, similarities in the energy sector. So uh, we have to include in these discussions, somehow the private sector that is the one who's gonna be uh, fostering and motivating these um, uh, ties at the economic level. Uh, to have a, a strong basis to make these similarities 
beneficial to both nations. I think that we, we, we have a lot of work to do still, the academics and the diplomats, to, to, um, to get the, the private sector into this uh, uh, scheme. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Would you like to say, yes, uh, Jorge Alvarez, Amb Ambassador Jorge Alvarez, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think it is uh, extremely uh, stimulating to hear, uh, having heard three very good presentations as a startup for this colloquium. And I, my comment goes in one direction. I think the need to have a dialogue between Mexico and Morocco is more than evident. But what might not be that evident is the, the, the use, the benefits, and also the, the added value that the dialogue that we can have, particularly in regards to what Mexico sees, understands, and perceives in regards to Latin America, but also North America, and what Morocco sees, foresees in regards to Africa and, the U and Europe. I think the dimension of the dialogue that needs to be foreseen in the coming future has to go, yes, in a bilateral uh, 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 sphere, but needs to go further on. That means these are the times as we are seeing not of a changing world, this is a change of epoch. It's a change of era. And I think we need to, to, to think big and to be foresighting. And I think the dialogue, so it's, no, it's, it's, no, it's not by chance that a university program like the one that hosts this uh, colloquium and seeing around the table the members of the uh, Moroccan delegation coming from uh, academic, uh, very distinguished academic institutions, this is the opportunity to broaden that dialogue. Mexico could benefit enormously from the understanding of the various developments which are taking place in Africa. We, we, have, we have the need to understand better what's taking place in different regions in Africa. And I, I'm convinced that also for Morocco, it'll be extremely useful and interesting to understand how, see, how Mexico sees what's taking place. Let's think for a moment on the energy uh, uh, sphere in regards to North America, or what is going geopolitically in South America. I think that has been that in my view, and I thank each and every one of the presentation has to be put on the agenda. Let's talk broadly. 360, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador uh, Jorge Alvarez. Yes, of course, Mexico, Morocco must be the door uh, for Mexico to, to go inside Africa. We need a lot. We, we need to learn a lot about Africa, a lot. <laughs> especially because we only have only, I think, six or seven embassies in Africa. That is terrible that we don't have more embassies, but Morocco will be seven, yes, eight. eight. Oh, okay, we hope so. Yes, and well, uh, but we need uh, to have more knowledge about Africa. And I would like to announce that we, uh, in, in, in a conversation with the persons that work in the Diplomado of Africa, we announce a prize for the best uh, thesis undergraduate, master and PhD on Africa. Uh, of course, not in written in Arab or in French or English, it has to be written in Spanish, and we are very close to the to the date. I don't remember which will be that, the date, but it's just maybe in one week. And there's a board who will decide which will be the best one, which is Colegio de México, Matias Romero, uh, um, the, the School of uh, uh, Political and Science and uh, Philosophy, and of course the the coordination. And it is going to be an award of around. 
think it's not too much, but it is uh, it is a little bit more than two thousand dollars to that first price. So we are very glad to in, uh, increase the knowledge of Africa, and of course Mexico is the, the the door to Latin America for Morocco, and we have even we have a postgraduate program in Latin American studies, a very well uh, program. Well, I am. Uh, I studied in that program. <laughs> and, and well, thank you very much. So I would like if a, a other person would like to, to say something. So we will, we will close here and we will invite you in a few minutes to our next, um, next session about diplomatic relations between Latin America and Morocco. Thank you very much. And I think we have a break here, right? Thank you. Thank you, Nusha Shekruni. Thank you very much to the New Global South. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I have some diplomas for you. Sorry, I have one for you. Uh, uh, what we will get this one is for um, Nusha. I have this one. I, I don't know if you see it. This is for you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's a great. <laughs> yes, it's. Uh, for your so my, my friend, uh, Her Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, Mrs. Gomez, as we are neighbors in Rabat, uh, I will ask her if uh, she might yes. bring it. She will be her pleasure, of course. She will. I will. I will give it to her, and she will give it to you. And then I will have so one much. to Mohamed Fidel Katani. Thank you very much. And here is the ambas our ambassador. Well, you can witness that I'm receiving your <laughs> diploma. <laughs> and this, this is for um, uh, Dr. Uh, Armando Sanchez. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Well, bye bye. <laughs>